wanted to pop on here really quickly. I shared a podcast episode yesterday with answering a whole bunch of sourdough questions that I've been getting constantly. There is a sourdough revolution going on. If, if you missed it, it's going on and it's crazy. I've had dozens and dozens of people sending me questions daily on Instagram, YouTube, by email, by Facebook. So I wanted to clear some things up because a lot of you are starting starters and having some issues. And so I put together a podcast and I was gonna just leave it there, but then I decided that I should put it on here as well. So I'm just gonna throw a picture up and then you're just gonna be hearing the audio. So if you have some chores to do today and you just wanna pop in some earbuds and get some of your sourdough questions answered. Also, I spent hours yesterday updating an ebook that I have. I rolled out a sourdough ebook a few years ago, and since then I've had a whole bunch more sourdough recipes that have come up on the blog, and so I updated it. It is now a long ebook with all of my sourdough recipes in one place, and I'm offering it for free right now just to respond to this demand of sourdough recipes. So you can grab that at bit.ly slash farmhouse sourdough, all of my recipes in one place for you to download and keep and find ways to use that sourdough starter every day in your life. So now I'm just gonna jump into the podcast episode and let you listen to it here on YouTube as well. You are listening to episode 29 of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. I yet again have my snoring snuggly baby tucked away here in the wrap and children running downstairs. Um, guys, I just started recording. <laughs> I know this is the reality for everyone pretty much right now, working from home, which has its advantages and disadvantages. I do it all the time and I actually really love it, but that will mean that there'll be interruptions. Today I want to talk about sourdough and some questions I get a lot. There is an absolute sourdough revolution going on. My blog is seeing double or triple the traffic that it usually does during this time because everyone is frantically making their food from scratch because it's just not available. Bread is not available. Yeast in a lot of areas isn't available. Unfortunately, in some areas, even flour isn't available, which means that you're definitely not having bread of any kind. But for the most part, it seems that people are able to access flour, unable to access yeast and bread, and therefore a sourdough revolution is going on. It is crazy. I have had multiple dozens of people every day tagging me in their sourdough starters. They're just starting. New sourdough starters are being born every day. With that comes a lot of questions. I'm getting flooded in my email, my Facebook messages, my Instagram messages, YouTube, questions on sourdough. And I completely understand it because it's a foreign concept, and it was to me too when I started about nine years ago is how old my starter is. After you get into it, it's really simple and easy to incorporate, easy to use. If you've been on the fence and you haven't started one yet, but you're still listening to this, I would recommend doing it because it's one of those things that it sounds really complicated, but once you get into it, it's so easy and will become second nature to you. But with that being said, when you first start, there's definitely gonna be some things that will happen with your sourdough, star sourdough starter, and you'll wonder, is this even right? What am I doing wrong? Is this going to work? And so I wanted to sit down and answer some of the frequently asked questions I'm getting, so that way I can, of course, refer people to it. That'll be helpful for me. But then also, these might be questions that you've wanted to ask but haven't, and they could be helpful. My name is Lisa, mom of six and creator of the blog and YouTube channel Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. So I'm gonna dive right in. I'm just gonna go into my Instagram DMs and pull out some of the most common ones that I'm getting. My starter on day four got really watery and the bubbles I had yesterday were gone. I threw it out because I didn't seem right. Help, thanks. I always tell people that when their starter is a bit watery, just to add a little bit more flour at the next feeding, it is normal for that to happen. If the liquid on top is a dark color, which is also a question I get a lot of times, that is referred to as hooch, and that happens whenever it's underfed and just needs a little bit more flour. The reason people experience this watery substance coming to the top 
is with the one-to-one flour-to-water ratio recommendation, which is called 100% hydration. I used to recommend half a cup of water and one cup of flour, but then everyone told me that it was too thick. I changed it to one and one. Now I get the question more often that it's too watery. Really, the right amount is probably somewhere around three quarter cups of water and a cup of flour. I hope that you're hearing me say here that the amount of flour and water isn't super important. What's important is that a starter is being built up by getting constant supply of new fresh flour that will help the yeast to develop at room temperature. So the amount isn't super important. I probably should change it back to three quarter cups of water and a cup of flour, but then I'll get a lot of confused people. I know a lot of people listen to my video I made years ago on this and say that, you know, I said a half a cup there and I change it to a cup. Quite honestly, it's not super important in, when you're in the developing it stage. Now for soup, certain recipes, you might want a different hydration, but just use the one-to-one -one ratio. If it gets watery, add a little bit more flour. It's also normal for starters to have a quiet period of time around day two, three, or four. When people send me pictures, if I see bubbles and I don't see any anything weird with it, I normally just tell them that it looks fine. Bubbles are a good sign. Once your starter is nice and established, I don't worry about measuring at all anymore with my starter. I like it to be the consistency of a really thick batter, kind of pourable. I don't like it to be a dough. I don't really like it to be running like milk or you know, very thin. Another question I commonly get is my starter won't rise. If I see bubbles in someone's starter who tells me this, I typically tell them to not throw it away. Just give it some more flour and a few more feedings to boost that yeast development. So if it was rising before and now it's not, I tell them to switch to a two time a day feeding regimen. Also, things really depend on the temperature. So if it's really warm in your house, it is going to become hungry more quickly and that will require more feedings. If it's cooler, not as much. If your starter isn't seeming very active, try putting it in a warm place. For me, that would be on my vintage stove or maybe a heating pad. I know in the summer, all of my ferments go more crazy, more bubbly and ferment a lot more quickly. All right, let's talk about that dark liquid called hooch. I know I mentioned it already before, but I get a lot of questions. What is the black liquid rising to the top? That is simply just an indication that the starter needs to be fed. It does not mold. Now, starters can grow mold, so watch for that as well, but if it's just a dark liquid rising to the top, that is called hooch. It's completely normal. You just need to feed it more regularly. You can stir it in or you can pour it off. It doesn't have the best smell. Hey buddy, I usually just stir it in though. Okay, I get a lot of questions about smell, what it should smell like. Some people describe it as really, really strong sourdough bread. Now I've had people say that my starter smells like nail polish mover, it smells like vomit, it smells vinegary. Usually that just means that it needs to be fed. If you left it in the fridge too long or left it out on the counter by mistake for a few days, in order to revive that situation, a lot of times I won't feed a whole bunch of flour and water to that. I'll just remove about a half cup of the starter and feed it with all fresh, maybe a couple cups of flour, a couple cups of water, and then allow a small amount of the underfed starter to take over the new flour and water. And typically that's how I'm able to revive it. I get tons of people who send me messages saying that they threw their starter away because of a certain smell or because it stopped bubbling. Typically, I think, oh no, just take a little part of it out, feed it some flour and water, keep going with the process. It is normal for these kinds of fluctuations to happen. And also it's environmentally based and based on flour. So to compare it to exactly how someone else's sourdough starter looks or to even how yours looked a few days ago, isn't always the best idea. Likely your starter is just fine and can totally be revived. They're quite a bit more resilient than you think. I've even read stories online more than once and even have some evidence from people in my life who've told me this, that they've had a starter sitting in the back of their fridge for months or even a year, brought it out and revived it. So likely if you are cultivating and maintaining a starter and you're not seeing bubbles for a few days or you're smelling a little bit of an off smell, it is likely still fine. They are way more resilient than people think they are. Don't be, don't be really quick to throw it away. Oftentimes people are really confused with the discarding that happens whenever you're building up a sourdough starter. 
And I understand that it's really confusing because why do you have to throw away half? Here is the reason. So if you start a starter and you use a cup of flour and a cup of water and you let it sit out for a day, if you don't discard half, let me show you what will happen. Day two, you will have to add a cup of flour and a cup of water and then you'll have approximately three or four cups of sourdough starter. Day three, because you have four cups of starter, you now need to feed it with two cups of flour and two cups of water. Day four, you need to be feeding it eight cups of flour and eight cups of water. You see where I'm going with this. It would grow exponentially during that cultivation process. Now, thankfully, there are a lot of recipes that you can use for the discarded sourdough. So for example, anything that isn't going to have to rise based on the amount of yeast in the sourdough alone. So bread wouldn't be a good idea to make or rolls or anything like that with the discarded sourdough starter. But something like pancakes that have a leavening agent in it, like baking soda or pizza crust that doesn't have to rise at all or my sourdough flatbread. I'm actually planning a post that is sourdough discard recipes. It'll be coming out in the next couple of weeks. But here are some examples that I just gave you. Also crepes are a really good one because they're thin and flat. It doesn't matter if it's not fully soured. Now, if the goal of making a sourdough starter is to ferment your grains because you are gluten intolerant and you have trouble digesting grains, then you, you might not want to use that discarded sourdough starter. But if you're able to tolerate water and flour mix, mixed up, then you can make any of those recipes and not get rid of it. I also have a sourdough crackers recipe coming out that's great for discarded sourdough starter. So whenever you are discarding it, just throw it in a bowl, put a lid on it, and wait until you have enough to make one of those discard recipes. You don't have to throw it away. Now, if you want to, you can put it into your compost, give it to your chickens. There's other sustainable ways to use that up without just throwing it away. But as you can see, you would end up with way more waste if you didn't discard it because by day, I don't, I'm not gonna do the math here, but let's just say that by day six, you'd be feeding it 32 cups of flour and water and you'd have a mess on your hands. Now the reason for that, because this is another thing, you have to feed a sourdough starter the amount of volume that it is. So if you're keeping on hand four cups of sourdough starter because you like to make pancakes that require three cups of starter, at least they really require two, but for my family, I times the recipe by one and a half and that's perfect, so it takes three cups. If you're keeping that amount on hand always, you need to feed it four cups of flour and water because otherwise it will be hungry. So if you're keeping a half cup of starter on hand, it's totally fine to feed it a cup of flour and water. But if you're keeping a lot more on hand, you can't just feed four cups of starter with a half cup of flour. It'll be hungry and you'll have hooch rising to the top within 12 hours. What I will do is I will have, say, two cups of starter sitting in the fridge. I'll pull it out if I wanna make pancakes tomorrow feed it a whole bunch of flour and water, at least two cups more, because I need to feed it at least the volume that I have. The next day I'll make pancakes, remove three cups from it, and then put it back in the fridge at one cup or two cups, if that makes sense. The, the goal is always feed it the volume that you have. You can't feed the same amount to two tablespoons of starter and six cups of starter. You have to respect the amount of flour that you are feeding. So with the process of starting a sourdough starter, the whole goal is to give flour and water enough time at room temperature for the beneficial yeast to be captured and to grow into a thriving starter. The whole time you have to make sure that it has enough sustenance. And to do that, to get the ball rolling, it needs a fresh supply of flour and water that is appropriate for the amount you're keeping. And that's the purpose of discarding sourdough starter. So I also get people who say, well, how about when I discard half, I just start another sourdough starter. Okay, here's the thing with that question. You're creating a symbiotic colony of yeast that you capture from the local environment. What you're trying to do is just make a master starter that then can inoculate anything else with the yeast colonies that are in it. You don't need to create more than one of those. It's basically just like having double the starter, which once you have an established starter, you can easily do by just adding more flour and water to the bowl of starter. If you're gonna make another starter with the discarded half, you might as well just made double in the same bowl. 
it's hard to describe, but once you understand the process of what's actually going on here and what you're doing, the question doesn't make sense anymore. So hopefully I've explained well enough what it is that you're even doing so that you can understand why it doesn't make sense to start another starter. This is the same reason why you'll want to share your starter with a friend. So whenever someone local to me says, I'm making a sourdough starter, I'm making a sourdough starter, I always say, well, why don't you just come get a half a cup of mine? Because you take a half a cup of mine, you feed it flour and water, boom, you're on year nine of your starter instead of day one. Because the yeast that are have been carefully cultivated in mine all these years will now take over the flour and water that you are feeding it. So it never makes sense for one person to make more than one sourdough starter or even for a friend to make a sourdough starter. Recently, someone local to me, well, local, they live about 45 minutes away, but asked if they could have a little bit of my starter and I just mailed it to them because of all the quarantines going on. But now instead of starting a starter, she can simply add flour and water to that and she's done. She doesn't have to start a starter. How do you store your starter? I store mine in a glass jar with a glass lid that isn't airtight. Now you could put it in a mason jar. It all depends on how much you wanna keep. Like I said, there are times when I like to keep a lot of starter just because whenever I make pizza crust, I have to use several cups at once because I make two pizzas for my family or when I'm making pancakes, I use several cups. So just keeping a little jar of starter wouldn't work for me. You totally could. Because most recipes, like a bread recipe or anything that soaks overnight, will only use about a half a cup and then you'll add that to flour and other ingredients for it to ferment that. But the no weight recipes, the one where you just take starter out and instantly make it into something, always require a lot more starter. And I like to keep it a lot on hand for that. So I keep mine in a gallon size glass jar it's like a the brand is anchor i use the same thing when i put it in the fridge you can visit my podcast episode 23 a week in the life of my sourdough starter to hear more about my routine when it comes out of the fridge when it's on the counter when i feed it what i make with it that will be really helpful for you to understand how all that goes do i need to discard half every time i feed my starter once a sourdough starter is established there is no longer a need to discard half now the exception to that would be let's say that you had five cups of starter in your refrigerator just because you built it up and then you never made anything with it you never made pancakes or something that requires a large amount of starter and you pull it out of the fridge and you want to keep it on your counter and make some things but you don't want to feed it with five cups of flour and five cups of water in that case you would have to take out half or you'd have to feed it with a whole lot of flour and water i would recommend in that situation this is what i do if i pull my sourdough starter jar out of the fridge it has five or six cups of starter in it. Instead of feeding it six cups of flour and six cups of water, I will first make a big old batch of pancakes and then I will feed it. So that way I don't have to keep that high of a volume on. Now, of course, I could have just discarded it instead of making the pancakes, but I have not discarded sourdough starter since I made my starter nine years ago. So no, you don't have to continuously discard sourdough starter. That is only in the starting process. And even still, if you don't wanna waste, make one of those recipes that are great for sourdough discard. Question, I got a tiny bit of starter from someone. Do I have to discard every day or can I just feed it every day to build up my amount and then start discarding? So in that case, if you got a half a cup or even a couple tablespoons of starter from a friend and it's really a mature starter, so they've had it for a month or more, add as much flour and water as you want and just start using it. No need to discard. Question, I made my sourdough starter with whole wheat flour. Can I use it in a recipe with all purpose flour? You totally can. The starter will feed off whatever you have in that recipe. I have totally done that where I take my whole wheat starter or my iron corn starter and then use it to make all purpose flour something. So just the other day, I made sourdough dinner rolls for my blog. I used unbleached all purpose because I wanted a light and fluffy sourdough roll, but I the sourdough starter that I used in that recipe was my usual einkorn sourdough starter, and it still rose the rolls beautifully. They were nice and fluffy, and the yeast in that einkorn starter had no trouble feeding on and taking over and rising that all-purpose unbleached flour. Someone asked what to do if their starter keeps overflowing the jar they're using. 
Just use a larger jar and keep less starter on hand would be the solution for that. Okay, hello again, I have another question. I hope that's okay. I watched your video on sourdough starter and I made one. Tomorrow is day five and when you say days five, six, and seven, start feeding it twice. Does that mean remove half and feed it two times a day or does that mean you don't remove half anymore and you feed it twice a day? Yes, you remove half both times. Daniel, you're so loud, buddy. The reason for discarding it while establishing it is to keep the ratios right. So if you didn't discard both times for both feedings, you would instantly throw them off and have to feed it double. I know I already talked about this, but it is a frequently asked question. So I wanna make sure we all understand it and how it works. Though you need to feed plenty to a sourdough starter, I haven't really found with a mature starter that you can feed it too much. So I will get my starter down. Let's say I'm making pizza crust and I pull my jar out of the fridge and it has four cups of starter in it. And I need basically most of those four cups to make two pizza crusts. I sometimes leave about a quarter cup of starter down in that jar and then I'll feed it a cup of flour, a cup of water. And then a few hours later, I'll feed it three or four cups of flour and water, I can build it back up so fast. And with my nice mature starter, it just takes it all back over and it all is sourdough starter within 12 hours again. So I don't hesitate to feed a ton of flour and water to a small amount of starter. What I do hesitate to do and what you shouldn't do is underfeed it. So feed a small amount of flour and water to a large amount of starter. So that totally dictates you know, how much you wanna keep on hand. You can go from keeping a little on hand one day to keeping a ton the next day and then back again. It isn't a constant thing that you need to keep consistent. Now putting it in the refrigerator does slow down the fermentation process almost completely. So you can leave it, like I said, weeks on end in the refrigerator, but once it's hanging out at room temperature, it'll need to be fed every day. If it's really warm, likely twice a day, like in the summer, I, it smells really fermented. It's looking really bubbly and flat and like it needs a feeding, maybe a little bit of hooch on top. If it's at room temperature for more than 12 hours in the summer when the house is really warm, so it totally depends. So what does fed sourdough starter mean when you when a recipe calls for it? Basically what I mean by this is that it's been fed, it's had flour and water added to it about eight hours before it's had time to sit and ferment at room temperature, but it hasn't been sitting in the fridge for days on end. It's been fed recently, had a chance to bubble up and feed, and then it's ready to be used for a recipe. Don't overthink this one. There are times when I pull a starter right out of the fridge that hasn't been fed in a week and I use it for a recipe and still have decent results. So it's not a super important part of the recipe. I definitely break those rules a lot and it's just fine, but that is what I mean by that. Is it okay to put my sourdough starter away unfed? So I don't usually like to put my sourdough starter away unfed, but that's not to say I haven't done it and it's not to say it hasn't turned out completely fine. Um, there's been times when I make pancakes, I put the starter straight into the fridge without feeding it after it and leave it in there all the way until next Friday and feed it again then and it's totally worked out. Now typically I like to put my sourdough starter away after it has been fed flour and water and sat out for about five or six hours. How do you make a gluten-free sourdough starter? This is actually completely new to me. I've been asked this question so many times that I thought I should probably make one. After doing some research, there are a few flours that are better for gluten-free sourdough starters. There are a lot of gluten-free flours, but the best ones that I have figured out in my research are teff, buckwheat, and sorghum. I ended up going with buckwheat. I've been doing the process exactly like I do my normal sourdough starter. So I started, I, I actually started with a quarter cup of flour, quarter cup of water. I did that for about four or five days and then I switched to twice a day feedings. It is bubbly, it is working. I've made pancakes with it. It's totally working out. I don't know if I'll maintain it like I have my other one. I kind of made it as a blog project, but since none of us are gluten free, I likely won't keep two starters alive for the next nine years like I've did my other one, but I don't know, I might, at least for a little while. I will be sharing that whole process on the blog. I have a video planned because I, I documented the whole process so that you can see how that worked out. 
A question I get a lot is, can I switch up what I'm feeding it? This is especially happening right now because people aren't able to find the flour that they're used to feeding their starter. So you might normally have a sourdough starter that you make with your own homemade wheat berries flour that you milled into your own flour. That's how mine is. Well, mine's now a einkorn starter. But anyways, now that it's the quarantines and every single place is selling out of all their grains, I have searched high and low for einkorn wheat berries for people that are asking me for regular wheat berries. They're gone. All my usual trusted sources, gone. Let's say now that you can find all-purpose flour, it's bleached, but you just need something to feed your beloved sourdough starter that you've been cultivating for the last six months totally can. I have done this so many times. I've switched mine from freshly milled whole grain flour to in a pinch, if I was waiting for a co-op order, an all-purpose flour, unbleached flour, and now I'm exclusively going with einkorn flour. I didn't have to do anything to switch or make that process happen. I just started feeding it einkorn flour and my sourdough starter accepted it just fine. Basically what's going on is it needs food, it needs something to sustain itself, and it will be fed by anything that's starchy. That's why certain flours are better, but any wheat, rye, even I've heard oat flour working, it will adapt and accept it. Now I have read in some places people recommend not doing this because they'll find that their loaves won't be as consistent, but I'm coming more from a health perspective than a baker's perspective. I love baking and I love making things beautiful, but I'm definitely not an artisan baker. I'm more of a practical mom of six over here just trying to feed my family healthy food. So from that perspective, I have no trouble with any inconsistencies that happen. My starter thrives being fed different flowers and yours likely will too. I do recommend unbleached all purpose, but if all you can get right now is all purpose, it's fine and it'll switch back just fine whenever you go to feed it what you wanted to before. Also people ask me, do you have a tutorial for making an einkorn starter? It's the same process as making a different starter, as making like a whole wheat modern day flour starter. But if you find that you don't want to waste einkorn flour because it's a lot more expensive, why not use cheap unbleached all purpose, make a starter, and then once it's good and established, feed it einkorn, and then you'll have an einkorn starter. Now, of course, it'll always have traces of that original flour, but after several months, I mean, you're talking a really small amount. The one way you would want to do this, of course, if you have celiac and you need to be gluten-free, you want to start with buckwheat or teff or sorghum and not switch a wheat starter to one of those flours because you will always have trace amounts of that gluten. And if you're super sensitive or you have celiac, that would be a problem. If you just want to become gluten-free in your family, but it's not motivated by celiac disease, you could take a regular sourdough starter and train it over to buckwheat. That is not what I did this time, just because I wanted to show you how to create a gluten-free starter from scratch, but that is something you could do, but do know that it'll always have trace amounts of gluten in it. Right, well, I hope that this has been helpful for you, and if I missed a question, I'm really sorry. These are just some of the ones that I get the most often. I really hope I've cleared up this process because I know it's something a lot of people wanna do. I hope that a lot of you will keep your starters going even after these quarantines are over. I hope that you'll just dive into this world and love it and it's not just a crisis mode thing. Make the sourdough cinnamon rolls, make the sourdough cobbler and the bread and the tortillas and the English muffins. You will be so happy you did. There is so much more to sourdough than just sourdough bread. It's how I like to do all of my baked goods and it's, again, once you do it and you make the starter, it is so easy to keep it around. You could feed it once a week or once every two weeks, leave it in your fridge most of the time. It's not hard to keep one going and to always have a starter around ready for all of these recipes. It is something that I would never go without in my kitchen. Even we we were on the GAPS diet for six months and I wasn't allowed to have grains, I kept feeding my starter because I knew that this wasn't gonna be forever and I did not want to forfeit my beautiful, long cultivated starter for a short time on the GAPS diet. It's really important to me in my kitchen and I would never, I would never go without it. So for today's Instagram question, what does your husband enjoy doing outside of family slash home renovations? My husband is a guy that loves the outdoors, hiking, 
bike riding, exploring state parks, anything natural, anything with water. Last spring, he went with a group of guys from our church to this cabin in the woods, and he has not stopped talking about it since. No TVs, no cell service, you know, fun restaurants or shopping or any of the luxuries that you might think were fun. Nothing of that, and that was like the best weekend of his entire life. He likes winter better than summer, which I find crazy, but whenever you go hiking, there isn't as much underbrush and bugs and ticks and mosquitoes, and so that's his motivation for loving that. For today's highlighted review, this one, the title is New Favorite Podcast. I'm loving Lisa's YouTube channel for a while now. I recently found this podcast. She's so easy to listen to and I've been inspired by her natural living and all the practical tips and tricks she has for parenting and homemaking. Especially during this quarantine, I've found this podcast to be so relaxing to listen to and a nice little escape. And thanks to her, I've started my first sourdough starter. Keep them coming. Yes, another sourdough starter. Thank you so much for that review. I am so glad to be walking so many of you through starting your own sourdough starters. Right, well, thank you so much for listening to this podcast. And if you haven't yet grabbed my sourdough ebook, I have all of my sourdough recipes in one place. I've just updated it so that now it has more. It used to only have 10. Now it has all of them so that you can just download it, print it off if you want to. I haven't yet wrote a book, so this is going to be the way that you can get my cookbook right now. It is at bit.ly slash farmhouse sourdough and it'll be delivered right to your inbox. All right, well, thank you for listening. If you have not yet started your own starter, I hope that this has given you the push you need to do it. There are so many amazing things that you can make with it. I have instructions on the blog. Just go to farmhousehomemoon.com. It's right there on the homepage. I'm featuring it because of course, it's very popular right now and lots of recipes as well. Thank you so much for stopping by the farmhouse.